Oh, I love uh, losing an hour of sleep. I'm sure we all you did. When I got up this morning, I'm going, what time is it? Oh. But probably help if I went to bed an hour earlier, but who does that, right? Who, who, who? Some people I might do, they think, oh, I'm going to lose an hour, so I better go to bed an hour earlier. But um, things happen. But I'm glad that you were able to make it this morning. Um, we are going to be looking in the book of Psalms again, Psalm 30. Psalm 30 is what we're looking at today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there with me. And as always, if you need a Bible, there are many on the back counter that you may take for yourself. Back counter has many Bibles back there. If you need one, just take one. And let's ask the Lord to uh, speak to us through his word. Father, we pray right now in Jesus' name that you would... Uh, Clear our hearts and minds of anything that be pulling us away or any weariness that are in our, us right now because of uh, distractions or because of uh, weariness in our body. We pray that, Father, you would help us to be attentive to hear what you would have to say to us because we came here to worship you and to hear from you this morning. So anoint my lips, Father, that the words may come forward, uh, that be your words to us for your glory. Father, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying for me each day, each week, many of you, and I do pray for all of you as well. Um, and uh, I know that um, I say that every week, but it's because I, it's true. It's because I want you to always know that I'm praying for you and that it's the one of the privileges I believe I have as a shepherd of a flock is to pray for the flock, regardless of, you know, I've maybe I haven't talked to you in a while, and still, I still, if you haven't come out of my mind uh, to keep praying for you, as always. Um, last week, we looked at Psalm 30, or, or Psalm 29, and we learned last Sunday in Psalm 29 that when we know God's greatness, our faith also becomes great. That our faith is lots of times uh, proportional to what we think about God, how great we think our God is. And that's what we learned last week and today, in Psalm 30, we're going to see that there may be times of mourning in our lives, but God is faithful, and he's merciful in the end. There will be times of sorrow, there will be times of mourning in this life. That's what life sometimes entails, as we are fully aware. But God is always faithful, God is always merciful in the end. If you look at the uh, little... dead. Uh, title, I guess you call it, of Psalm 30. In your Bible, mine says, A Psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. And so, as we know anything about David's history, the temple actually was not built until after David uh, was um, passed away. He actually had his son Solomon build the temple. So what David is probably doing, a Psalm of David, David wrote this psalm for the future dedication of the future temple that he had already been planning. He did uh, uh, set aside uh, money and he did set aside materials for the temple to be built. So he knew the temple was going to be built, but it wasn't built in his lifetime. It was going to be in the future. And so perhaps he wrote the psalm uh, at the dedication of the temple, meaning that he, pre he wrote it knowing that the temple would eventually be finished by his son, and then which he had uh, told him to and that this uh, psalm was used at that dedication. And so that's why a little just, uh, note there. Let's go into verse 1 of Psalm 30. David starts with, I will extol you, O Yahweh, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. The word extol, I will extol you, means to exalt to extol also means to lift something up, to lift you up. He's saying, I will lift you up, O Yahweh. I will exalt you, O Yahweh. So David lifts up God in the eyes of those who will be singing the psalm. Again, this is going to be at the dedication of the temple. And this, they will be singing this psalm. That's what psalms are. They're songs to be sung in worship. And he says, so he starts with saying that he's, he's asking the people who will be singing to lift up God in their own eyes. I will exalt you. I will extol you. I will lift you up, O Yahweh, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. 
And so he says, when he says, you have drawn me up, I will extol you, O Lord. I will lift you up for you have drawn me up. The term draw me up is like when you put a bucket of water into a well, because that's how they got their water back then. You put it into a well and you, what you do is you'll, you'll drop the bucket below the surface of the water and then lift up, draw up the bucket from the from the depths of the water, from below the surface, and draw up out of the water. And so that image is what he's saying is that is is what God is doing to David. Okay, you have drawn me up from below my despair or below my mourning, just as God drew Jesus up from deep within the the grave, from from death, and then raised him up from the grave. And so we too are similar in that we are drawn up, that we too at times, we are like buckets submerged beneath the depths of our sin or the depths of our issues or problems. That we too sometimes are like a bucket submerged between the depths of our sin, powerless to lift ourselves out of the water, but then God reached down and lifted us up, drove us up, and made us alive. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. You have taken me out from beneath the surface of my sin, beneath the surface, and drawn me out. As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see the term? He raises us up, right? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And so as you see, just like in Ephesians, he's saying that we were dead in our trespasses. We were separated from God before Christ died for our sins. And then what he did was when he died on that cross and was resurrected, he made us alive again. He drew us from beneath our sin and drew us out. He raised us up and seated us with him uh, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So God raised us up with Christ. He made us his dearly beloved children and seated us in the heavenly places. And now... What we do in, res- in response is we lift up the name of Jesus. We lift up the name of Jesus and we exalt him for what he has done for us. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. See, sometimes we might wonder, if you ever wonder what heaven's going to be like, for example, sometimes we might wonder that what we are going to be doing for an eternity in heaven and one of the things that we know that we'll be doing is we will be worshiping. And so you might wonder, how is it that we can praise God to worship God for an eternity? And when we wonder that about that, how can we praise God for an eternity? The reason why we wonder that is because we don't yet fully understand God's amazing grace. So you see, if we're wondering why we would worship God for an eternity, we're not really understanding, we're showing that we don't truly understand or fully understand God's amazing grace, how he has literally drawn us up from the depth of our sin, of separated from God. He's drawn us up from the depth of darkness and raised us up far above, as it says in Ephesians, above all things. He's raised us up above the selfishness He's raised us up above our pridefulness and our worldly strife. And so when we see things from God's heavenly perspective, we will see then the enormity of his grace, of what he has done and what he has accomplished and how good he is to his people and to us. And after seeing the depths truly from which he has lifted us, we will not want to stop praising him when you truly appreciate the depths from where we would be without him to where we are in Christ, lifted up, raised us up in the heavenly places, we will not stop praising him. We won't when we truly appreciate that. And that's what we'll be doing and that's what we sing in all its glory in heaven, the depths from which he took us and 
how great of a privilege it is that he has lifted us. We will not want to stop praising him. You see, our world without God, you know, if you imagine yourself, if, you're not, if you are a believer, imagine yourself if you were, did not have Jesus in your life. Imagine if you didn't know God. And it would, the world without God is like being in a pit of alligators or, or piranhas. Okay? You'll just be eaten alive. Imagine being in a world like that. You'll mentally be physically, you'll be just eaten alive without God in your life. You know, if you remember, this, uh, if you ever saw the movie Indiana Jones, and he's in a, he's a pit of snakes, right? Every time he goes to a, somewhere in the, in, in somewhere he's searching, he's, he ends up in a pit of scorpions or a pit of snakes. And then somehow, of course, because it's a movie, he doesn't die, he gets lifted out, right? He gets rescued, he comes out. And that's what God does. He, you're in a pit of snakes without Jesus in your life. You're in a pit of vipers. That's what the world is. And God literally lifts you up out of those depths and pulls you up and raises us up. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. We can appreciate what David's saying when we truly understand what he has accomplished in our lives through his death and resurrection. Let's go on to verse two. O Yahweh, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. Oh, Yahweh, you have brought up my soul from Sheol and you restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. He's saying, Yahweh, my God. The word, oh, Lord, is capitalized. Lord is capitalized. And again, whenever you see that in the Old Testament, it's actually translating the, the name of God, Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh, my God. Notice he says he's my God. Yahweh, you're my God. See, that expresses a close relationship that David had with God. It's my God. One uh, commentator that I was reading, uh, Mr. Uh, Van Gemmer, has, has says, it is in the intimacy of our communion with God, he says, that lies the secret of answered prayer. It is in the intimacy of our communion with God, our intimacy with God, that lies the secret of answered prayer. The closer that we are with God, that we share the same thoughts as he does. We share the same feelings as God does. And when we pray according to his will, as we know, that gets our prayers answered. And so we want a close relationship with him. And so he says, oh Lord, you are, or Yahweh, you are my God. I cried to you for help and for you have healed me. I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. David was healed from some kind of ailment that he had been afflicted with, or he had been healed uh, figuratively of a trial that he had been going through that nearly took his life. I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. Okay, it could be a trial in his life that he could be talking about, or it could be a literal physical ailment that he is dealing with. And God, it says, brought him up from Sheol, verse 3. Oh, Yahweh, you have brought me up from Sheol. The word Sheol is the Hebrew word for the grave. You have brought me up from the grave. Therefore, because of what God has done, you have brought me out of the grave. You, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. Therefore, verse one, I will extol you. I will exalt you because he brought us up from the grave and restored David to life. You restored me, verse three, to life from among those who go down to the pit. You see what David's appreciating there? I was in the pit. I was in a pit of vipers. I was a pit of my despair. I was in the pit and I was going through a difficult time physically or emotionally or, or circumstantially in my life and you drew me out of that pit of vipers. You drew me out of that pit of alligators or piranhas, whatever you want to liken the world without God is like. You drew me out and that's why I extol you. That's why I lift up your name. I lift you up because it's a response to what God has done. Jesus himself was buried in the tomb and before God raised him from the dead. Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. See, that's a prophecy that David wrote in Psalm 16 talking about what happened to Jesus Christ, his descendant that God did not abandon him to the grave. He was in the grave three days. And then three days later, after he was buried in that tomb, he was raised. 
You will not let your Holy One see your corruption. His body did not decay in the grave. It was resurrected. And so that's what he's celebrating here. And just as God did not abandon Jesus in that grave, as we will be celebrating later this month on Easter, just as God did not abandon Jesus in the grave, so God will, not, will also, quote, heal everyone who knows Jesus as their Savior. For you have healed me, verse 2. God will also heal us, each one of us who knows Jesus as Savior, by resurrecting our bodies in heaven. I will extol you, O Yahweh, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Yahweh, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Yahweh, you have brought me up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Amen to that. And that's why we will not want to stop praising God forever. When you truly appreciate what he has done and where you would be without what he did for us, where you would be without Jesus in your life, then we will truly praise him. We will truly not want to stop praising him for an eternity. And that's what David is hinting at here. He's, 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 re- he's remembering what God has really done for him and extolling and exalting God for that. And so God is the one who lifts us up from the depths of sin and restores our lives. And David's response to what God has done begins in verse 4. Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing praises to Yahweh, all you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. This is David's response to what God has done for him. This is David's response. His anger is but for a moment, he says. Verse 5, sing praises to Yahweh, all you saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Verse 5, David invites all of God's people, who he calls saints. We're all his saints, because we have been redeemed by Christ. He he asks, he invites all of them to sing praises to God. Why? Why sing praises to God? Verse 5, his anger is but for a moment. See, God's anger is but for a moment. It's temporary. God may truly uh, discipline those he loves. He disciplines me. He disciplines all of us in time. He may discipline us, but it's always for our good. And it is only temporary. When he disciplines us, when he allows trials into our lives to discipline us, it's for our good and it's only temporary. His anger is only but for a moment, but his favor, his favor is for a lifetime. His favor is his grace, his undeserved favor that he gives to us. His grace is what endures forever. And his discipline may last temporarily. And so even Jesus himself endured wrath for a moment. His anger is but for a moment, and even Jesus endured that. When did Jesus experience the wrath of God? When he died on the cross. It wasn't for his sins, of course, that he died, but he experienced the wrath of God when God poured out death on him. They allowed him to die on that cross and poured out his wrath on him for our sins. It's when he took our sins upon himself and his father literally turned his face away temporarily from Jesus as he hung on that cross. Remember what Jesus said? In Psalm 22, verse 1, as he hung on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22, verse 1. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus literally said that on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? See, David, uh, Jesus experienced the wrath of God for our sake. Jesus experienced that wrath. Jesus bore God's wrath The anger, for his anger is but for a moment, verse 5 in Psalm 30. Jesus bore God's wrath for a moment so that we would not have to endure the wrath ourselves. See, Jesus endured the wrath of God so that we would not have to endure the wrath of God. See, after Jesus bore God's wrath on that cross, he experienced God's favor again. Weeping may tarry for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Verse 5. Weeping may come because of our own sin. Weeping may come because we suffer as part of living in this fallen world that we live in. 
There is mourning in this earth. Yet, weeping may tarry for the night, verse 5, but joy comes with the morning. When God gives us relief, it's called the morning. It may arrive soon, or it may arrive at the last day, but there will be joy in the morning. It will surely come. Weeping may tarry. We will face sorrow in this world. Again, either it's because of our own sin or because we just live in this fallen world. There will be mourning on this earth. But joy comes in the morning. It will surely come. When Jesus died, there were tears, certainly, on Good Friday. But there was joy on Resurrection Sunday. For believers in Jesus Christ, there may be tears when we die or when our loved ones die, even if we are believers. But there will be joy at the resurrection in heaven. Notice there are several contrasts here in these ver- in verse 5. There is the anger, but there also is favor. His anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. There's also the contrast of there is a moment. Weeping may tarry for the night, or his anger is for the moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. There's the moment and there's the lifetime. And then there's weeping in verse 5. May tarry for the night, but there's joy, weeping and joy. And then there's night, and then there's morning. These contrasts, anger, favor, mo- moment, lifetime, weeping, joy, night, and morning, these show the range of these contrasts, the range of these contrasts, night and day, weeping, joy, show the depth of God's grace. The range of these contrasts show the depth of God's care for us. In his anger, for example, or in his anger, or his favor, in his times of anger or favor, he cares for us. In the time of morning or evening, he cares for us. Therefore, what he's saying is that we can depend on him regardless of our circumstances. Whether it's night or day, whether it's, there's a time of anger or favor, whether it's a time of weeping or mourning, we can still know that God still cares for us always. Therefore, we can depend on him always. We can rely on him. We can trust in him in all circumstances in our lives. David tells God's people to give thanks to his holy name. Verse 4, sing praises to Yahweh, O you saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Why? Because of God's forgiveness. His anger is only for about a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. And so he's reminding us how to respond to his grace. Sing praises to Yahweh, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Verse 6, as for me, I said in my prosperity... I shall never be moved. As for me, David says, I said in my prosperity, he's talking to himself, I shall never be moved. David is confessing here that he had a prideful and sometimes self-confident heart. I said in my prosperity, I will never be moved. He's talking about his own bravado, his own self-confidence. He said he was was prosperous. He was rejoicing in his prosperity. And because of the comfort and the security that he felt in his prosperity, he says, I shall never be moved. When everything is going well, when he prospered, David felt secure. David felt self-confident. We do the same thing. David, when God's blessings, when we have experienced God's blessings and we have an abundance in our lives, it can lead to pridefulness if we're not careful. It can lead to a self-righteous attitude. We may think, I shall never be moved. I'm doing well. What can go wrong? I felt that before. When things are going well in our lives, when things are, are, are flourishing, when I succeed in, in many things, I start feeling good about myself. Maybe you feel the same way. You start feeling good about yourself. And then, if I'm not careful... I become self-righteous or I become self-confident. I say in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. What can go wrong? But in verse 7 of Psalm 70, 
By your favor, O Yahweh, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. You hid your face, but I was dismayed. But only by your favor, verse 7, O Yahweh. Only by his grace, he's saying, by your favor. Only by God's favor that we can stand strong. Only by your, by your favor, O Yahweh, you made my mountain stand strong, he says in verse 7. See, back in verse 5, he's saying about God's anger. In his anger is but for a moment. And that's what he says back in verse 5. The Lord afflicted David to the point that he was weeping back in verse 5. In his anger, the Lord afflicted David or allowed suffering in his life to the point that he was weeping from suffering or from his repentance. Perhaps he was weeping because he was repentant. And then in verse 2, it says, David cried out to God. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help. And so David cried out and God healed him, it says. And so David experienced, means that David experienced forgiveness for his arrogant heart in verse 6. He's saying, in, in my prosperity, I shall not be moved, but I cried out to you, God. I cried out, you humbled me in your anger, you disciplined me, and there was weeping, but then I cry out to you now in response. And that's how we look at the psalm as a whole, that it's a response. David experiences God's forgiveness for his arrogance in verse 6. And God restored him in verse 3. Oh Lord, you have brought my soul up from Sheol and you restored me to life. And so he put this psalm together and that's what he's doing. It's a response to his own pridefulness in verse 6. Okay, I said in my prosperity, I shall not be moved. What's going what's gonna to touch me? Who's going to touch me? Things are going so well. We get self-confident. That's what happens to human nature. That happens to me all the time. I start feeling confident in myself and I get prideful. I get, I get you know, I think only myself. Everything's going well. I feel secure. I feel self-confident. But God's favor, like it says in verse 5, means blessing, healing, and restoration. It changes our weeping to joy, into joy. David knew that this change did not come from his own efforts, though. David knew that his change of fortune did not come by his own efforts because David knew that he was totally incapable, he was totally incapable of bringing himself out of that grave. As it says in verse 3, you have brought me up from the grave. You have brought me up from Sheol. But David knew that wasn't him that did that. It's only by his favor. Verse 7, by your favor, O Yahweh, you made my mountain stand strong. Only by God's favor, his grace, are we able to stand strong. See, our dependence <clears throat> upon God is what makes us stand firm, is what he's saying. In David's own strength, he was weak. David was a powerful king. He was a great warrior. He slew Goliath. But by David's own strength, he was weak. When he depended on God, however, he had the strength like a mountain. You made my mountain stand strong. And then he continues in verse 7, you hid your face. I was dismayed. You hid your face. David was dismayed without God when God hid his face from him when God disciplined him for the moment because of his arrogance in verse six. It was like when Jesus was on the cross in Psalm 13, verse one. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? See, that's what happened to Jesus at that moment that he was dying on that cross. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face? Perhaps you've asked that question of God yourself. How long, O oh Lord, must I endure what, this circumstance or endure this issue that I'm dealing with, the problems, the, the health issue or, or the trials? How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? See, often I had to come to learn the same thing that David learned. Often in my life, I had to learn that I am also, like David, totally incapable of living as God has called me to by my own efforts. 
And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've tried to say, well, I understand what Jesus did for me on the cross, so I'm going to be a good believer in Christ. I'm going to, you know, follow him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to I'm going to love him. I'm going to do my best and, and, and come to the church and, and do all the great things. And that's great. However, you will come to a point where you will fal- falter at times. Okay, you will sin like I do. And I have to learn over and over again that I'm totally incapable of living as God has called me to live by my own strength. You know, when I first came to this church, I remember I had you know, visions of grandeur. When I came to this church, I came from a a very large, uh, uh, flourishing church. And I thought, well, I'll just do what I was taught, okay, both both in the previous church I was in and when I was taught in seminary, and things will just kind of work out by themselves. Things will just automatically just work out and things will just be great. Wrong, okay, wrong. If I'm depending on my past experience, if I'm depending on myself in any way or my seminary training, if I can depend on anything except for God, I will fail. And I did many times. Unless God helps me, there's nothing that I can do that will matter. Nothing. No matter how much I preach God's word or prayer or whatever, it's not going to happen unless God helps me. Amen? You're not going to live anything and do anything for God. You're not going to even live as a Christian much longer unless God helps you. I thought when I got married, for example, I thought, well, because we love each other, you ever thought this? Well, it's going to be easy, right? You just get married because we love each other. It's going to be easy. Wrong. Unless God helps you every day, you're not going to be a good husband. You're not going to even stay married. Amen? Amen. By the grace of God, I cannot serve in this church. By the grace of God, I can't be a, a, a good husband. I can't even stay married unless God helps me. You have to understand what David did. You can't do anything without his help. Unless, and then when I became a father, right? If you have kids, I thought, you know, if I, as long as I feed my kids and they have clothes to wear and I make it through the week, boy, that, that's it. That's my job. I'm doing a great job as long as they survive the week. Oh, you know, because that's going to be hard enough, you know? Four boys at home, as long as I fed them and clothed them and they're not dead, you know, they survived, then I'm doing a good job as a father. No. No. Unless God helps me and God has mercy on me, I'm a failure as a parent. And so that's what David is saying is you have to realize that in your prosperity, you might say, I, you know, uh, I'll never be moved. That's arrogance on David's part. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mouth and strength stand strong. You hid your face, or perhaps we hide from God and we ignore him. I was dismayed. See, we're going to come to that conclusion one way or another. You're going to go, and as you're a parent, or as you're in your marriage, or in you're trying to be a believer in Christ, you're going to fail so many times. You're going to say, what, what's wrong? It's because we need, and we we're never meant to live the Christian life with, on our own. We are meant to depend on him. It's by his favor and his grace that we can do anything. As for me, I stood in my prosperity. I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Yahweh, you made my mountain strong. You hid your face and I was dismayed. And until we remember that we need him for everything, you're going to have a hard time. And that's the way it should be. Because we need to learn to depend on him alone in all things. And so God may discipline us at times. Circumstances may hit up in our lives that are not favorable in our lives. God may discipline us in his love. In his love to correct our prideful self-confidence. Like David did in verse 6. So that we will learn to depend on him. <clears throat> And that's what we need to learn. And we're going to learn it one way or another. That we need him. I need him. I cannot live a single day as a believer without God helping me. Helping me be a father. Helping me be a husband. Helping me be a, 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 a Christian. Much less even a pastor. How much we need him. So God may discipline us 
in his love to correct our prideful self-confidence so that we will learn to depend on him. And so God lifts us up from the depths of our sin and restores our lives. Then he may correct our self-confident pride to teach us to rely on him alone. And as opposed to trusting in his prosperity, David says in verse 8, To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. This is what David does. To you, O Yahweh, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. He's pleading for God's grace. I plead for mercy. He's saying, I plead for God's undeserved favor. I plead for your mercy. I plead for your grace. Without your grace, I cannot get through it. Without grace, I can't pick myself up again after I fail as a Christian over and over. And I sin, even though you know I'm a believer for many years, I still sin. Well, without his grace, I'm not going to be able to, to, to go on. I'm going to fail as a husband many times. I fail as a father many times. Without his grace, I will not be able to keep go move forward again. To you, O Lord, I cry, and I, to the Lord I plead for mercy. You need his grace to, get, to keep, keep going. Verse 9, what profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? This is David speaking to God here. What gain, he's saying, would it be if, I, if David died? Likewise, what benefit would there be if Jesus died and was not resurrected? What profit there is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? See, if Jesus had not risen from the dead and if he just stayed dead in that grave, we would still be in our sins. Our sins would never have been paid for. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, we would still be in our sins without hope for salvation. The cross would would actually have been a loss. And Jesus would not have triumphed over the devil. Will the dust praise you, verse 9? Will it tell of your faithfulness? David is vowing, therefore, that if God does deliver him, and he does not just die and turn to dust, What David is saying, he's vowing to praise God. That's what he's getting at here. What profit there is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? What David is doing is he's implying that he will praise you if if he delivers him from this ailment, if he heals him, if he restores him to life. David is vowing to praise God to tell of his faithfulness. Will it tell, will the dust tell of your faithfulness? No. But an alive person, a restored person, a person who receives your grace can tell of your faithfulness, and that's who we are. We are like dust who has been restored to life, and we are the ones who will tell of God's faithfulness. We will worship him. We live to worship him when God delivers him. The faithful will live to praise God and will tell of God's faithfulness. Verse 10, hear, O Yahweh, and be merciful to me. O Yahweh, be my helper. So because God has made his covenant with his people, David calls on him for mercy and help. God is the one who made the covenant promises to his people, and there is no one else. Hear, O Yahweh, and be merciful to me. O Yahweh, be my helper. He's appealing to God's promises of his covenant. Psalm 54, verse 4, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. God is your helper. God is the one that we are solely to depend on for all of our needs. He will help us. He's the one that only can help us. You can't help yourself. Your friends can't help you the way God can. Okay, as good as your friends may be, it's God that you need. It's God that I need every day of my life. Verse 11, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Yahweh, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. You have turned my mourning into dancing, he says. Verse 11, God turned a funeral into a wedding. 
God turned a funeral into a wedding banquet. Heaven is likened in many places to be like a, 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 a wedding banquet. Heaven is like a wedding banquet between Jesus and his bride. The bride is the church. Revelation chapter 19 verse 9 says, The angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, married to his bride, the church. He unites us in heaven. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have turned a funeral into a banquet. There are times of our times of mourning in our lives, as we all know, but they will not last forever. Eventually, the mourning that we experience here on this earth, the sorrow that we experience on this earth, will give way to rejoicing and dancing. You have turned my mourning into dancing. Such is the goodness of God. Yes, there is mourning on this earth, but it will eventually give way to rejoicing. You have loosed my sackcloth, it says. Sackcloth was, was what people did when they mourned in uh, people of Israel. They wore this burlap type material, like a sackcloth, and wore it as a sign of mourning. You have loosed my sackcloth. And instead, you have clothed me with gladness, verse 11. Mourning will be changed into gladness, is what he's saying. It's like putting on new clothes. Have you ever experienced mourning so deeply that it made your heart sick? Okay, it just like literally made your heart sick when you, when you heard the news of something or something happened to you or someone close to you and you were mourning so deeply it made you literally sick. <laughs> I remember when my older brother died in an auto accident. And I was 16 years old. And my parents were, as you might imagine, so heartbroken. They lost their son suddenly. He was on his way back to the Air Force Base that he was stationed at. And we were not a knock on the door by the police. And they informed us that our, our, my, his, their son had passed in the auto accident. Can't tell you how heartbroken my parents must have been. I remember that day. And I didn't know at that time how things would ever be the same again, experiencing that. I'd wake up each day afterwards thinking it might just be a bad dream, but it, was, it wasn't. It was a nightmare. Two years later, I became a believer in Jesus Christ. Two years later. And one day, as I was looking through some of my uh, brother's papers that he had in his desk, I don't know, I was in his room, two years later, and I discovered a document that basically said that my brother had become a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. I didn't know that. I found out that he had become a born-again Christian while he was uh, in, in his base. And I kind of remember looking back that, yeah, he did kind of change a little bit. I just thought he was homesick. Maybe he missed me. I don't know. He was, he was nicer to me. <laughs> didn't punch me anymore. Took me to a movie a few times. Took me, and I realized it dawned on me, oh, he had been changed by... Jesus Christ. That's why he was very nice, nice for me. I didn't know that. Didn't share that overtly, but I found out later. And so uh, later on, years later, after my mother died, my father became also a believer in Jesus Christ in this church, as many of you know. And so now my mourning has turned into rejoicing, right? It took years. Didn't happen right away. But my morning that I experienced, I remember that day when my brother died. How will things ever be the same? How can this, uh, uh, this nightmare? But eventually, as I learned that he became a believer, and then my father came to this church, he became a believer, I know that we will, I will see them one day again. I know now that I will see them in heaven when I get there as well. And so now I will rejoice. I rejoice now over these things that I previously mourned over. I will rejoice that we'll see one another again. Verse 11, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. It will come. It may take a while, but it will come. Trust him. That my glory, verse 12, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. When he's saying my glory, he's saying he's praising with our whole being. 
My whole being will praise God in response to his undeserved grace. Verse 7 again. By your favor, O Yahweh, you made my mountain strong. That's his grace. By your grace, by your favor, you made me strong. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, Romans chapter 6, verse 4, we were buried together with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Amen to that. We were buried with God, with Jesus, into death, in baptism, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So we now have this new joy that we have in Christ. We have this new hope. We have a new life because we are joined with Jesus in our, his resurrection. And one day, our body will rise again with him. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And that's what we have to look forward to, the day of our resurrection when we are in Christ. We were created to praise God who will one day turn our mourning into dancing and we will give thanks to him forever. Trust him in that. Trust him in that. Yes, there's tr sorrow, there's trials and you think, well, how is this ever gonna be, how am I ever gonna be glad again? How am I ever going to get through what I'm going through? Trust him. He will turn your mourning into dancing. We were created to praise God. And we will one day turn, he will one day turn our mourning into dancing. And we will give thanks to him forever. And so God is the one who lifts us up from the depths of our sin to restore our lives. God also may correct our prideful self-confidence at times to teach us to rely on him because he loves us. And we were created to praise God who turns our mourning into dancing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have taught us again from the Psalms what it means to be truly worshiping you from the heart. It's all response. It's all response to your grace. It's a response to what you have done. And it's true that there are times of mourning on this earth, but we trust that you will turn our mourning into dancing in, true, in due time. Help us, Father, to remember that, to trust in you always, to rejoice in you always. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.